What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another live stream. Uh, today we are talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is soaring to new all-time highs um, of 23,000. Uh, this is really exciting for all you Bitcoin uh, bulls out there. I'm, of course, long Bitcoin. Uh, been owning it since 2013, so super pumped. Uh, my laptop fan is on, but other than that, we got an epic live stream ready to go here. I am going to take you to my uh, shared screen here. So this is CoinMarketCap. It's my favorite website to check on cryptocurrency just because... Uh, I don't know. It's just they have the best layout and I'm a big fan. Uh, they were actually bought by Binance and they have all the cryptocurrencies listed right here in weight of market capitalization. I believe Bitcoin by far the number one uh, cryptocurrency in the last 24 hours up 9% to $22,500. I put 23,000. It did hit that last night, but it's it's been going uh, up and down like crazy. And so this is extremely exciting news. As you can see, Bitcoin, um, the last huge run, it went from $1,000 to about $20,000 uh, at the end of 2017 before crashing big time um, and hitting about $3,000 and then spiking back all the way to $20,000 here and then up to breaking out this new highs to $22,000. So I, what I think has happened, as you can see with Bitcoin, and you couldn't even see this move here. We had a big parabolic move way back in the day. You can't even notice it on the chart, um, but it's like, uh, yeah, sorry guys, my laptop fan is on. I'm going to get this fixed soon. I'm still not in my new HQ, but bear with me. We're going to get the live stream going. Um, so this is, I, I'm pumped. Bitcoin is soared to new highs here. Now the market capitalization of Bitcoin is 400 and, oh, let's round it up, $420 billion. Um, it's a new all-time highs of the monetary network. And so I thought it was a fascinating time to take a dive deeper into the fundamentals of Bitcoin because it's not just a price. You know, I think Bitcoin, it, it, you know, is a fundamental asset um, as this new idea of a new way to store value and a new currency in the digital economy. So now we need to think about how do we value this currency? To me, it's not the PE ratio, it's not the cash flow. Uh, there's a totally different set of networks when looking at a monetary or crypto asset versus a stock. So I'm gonna show you what sort of, uh, you know, metrics I look at when valuing Bitcoin. So, share my screen. This is a company called bitinfo.charts. Not the most beautiful charts in the world, but um, definitely some cool charts here. So I just kind of want to show you, um, this is my favorite metric to track basically the progress on the Bitcoin network and as dollars move. And I do think it is slightly correlated to speculation. Like if a lot of people um, are speculating and, you know, buying and trading Bitcoin, it's going to inflate the dollar moved on the network. But at its core value, you know, any currency to me should be valued based on its utility. And its utility is going to be determined by how many people are using it, um, how much money is being spent on that network. And so Bitcoin right now, as we can see, this, this G number is actually billions. Um, so you can actually see that Bitcoin here actually... Uh, my comment thing is in the way. Sorry. But yeah, Bitcoin. So here we go. This number right here is the number you want to look at. And on this chart, it's not perfect. We can see Bitcoin's moving about 20 to $30 billion a day on this network. And so this is, to me, when I think Bitcoin is one of the most successful economic experiments in the world. We're literally moving $30 billion per day on this network. Um, and this is becoming one of the world's largest uh, computational networks. So I want to show you something to compare. This is PayPal's third quarter investor report. Um, and you can see that the total payment volume of the third quarter for PayPal was $247 billion. So PayPal is a company that is worth about $300 billion, moving about $300 billion a quarter. Bitcoin in a day is moving 30, 40, 54 billion yesterday. And so Bitcoin is moving in five days the amount of PayPal that's moving as a quarter. But yet the market capitalization of Bitcoin, 422 billion, if we take a look at PayPal, the market capitalization of PayPal here um, is 276 billion, but yet Bitcoin is moving like 10 times as much money. So on a price of monetary network, I think this is fascinating. And I think the dollar moved on Bitcoin has a chance to go way up. Another thing that I think is really interesting happening in the Bitcoin network here is transactions. So this is what I used to think was an extremely important network. Um, yo, super chat. Thank you, Tommy. Yes. Well, I have a Tesla episode that's coming out, but this is a Bitcoin one. So stay tuned for that. But, um, so this is the transactions on the Bitcoin network. How many transactions happen a day? I thought this is one of the most important metrics to watch because it's like, okay, well, the, the network's value is based on how many times we can transact on it. You know, if, if we're gonna use Bitcoin as the world's global digital internet currency needs to be transacting like a billion transactions a day. So we need to watch this transaction thing go up, but that wasn't happening. But what was happening is A, people are moving a lot bigger transactions on Bitcoin. And there's a lot of off-chain level two solutions. And so this is a fascinating way Bitcoin is growing. And my biggest debate about the Bitcoin energy consumption, this is, um, uh, so, so soak in this transaction chart, because now I'm about to give you a rant about why I don't care about Bitcoin's energy consumption, or I do, but 
Bitcoin consumes a lot of energy because of its proof of work algorithm. I think A, it's not like it's the alternative doesn't consume any energy. The entire financial fiat system where you currently transact does have carbon emissions associated with it. So it's not like these Bitcoin ones are coming out of nowhere, but it's also the amount moved on the network. Transactions are staying flat, yet dollars moved is spiking because dollar move per transaction is soaring. And that's because you have off-chain and layer two solutions handling more of the transaction volume. Square, Cash App, PayPal, Coinbase are going to be doing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of transactions before settling them on the blockchain in one big chunk. Um, that's why Jack Dorsey is investing in a company called Lightning Labs, because that's a layer two Bitcoin solution company, because eventually when you do your cup of coffee or trading Square or Cash App moving Bitcoin, it's not going to settle on the main chain. And therefore, what I'm trying to say is the pollution per dollar moved and pollution uh, per, yeah, per, per, you know, essentially pollution per value on the network per transaction on the network is going way down over time. And if you don't believe me, here's a uh, average transaction. Okay, so here's cent in USD. So transactions are flat, but cent in USD is soaring. If we go to the average transaction volume here, we're looking at almost $100,000, $200,000 average transaction size in the Bitcoin network. And so think about this. If it, you know, I saw this really good tweet for someone that was like, what about the pollution of Bitcoin, Galley? You know, one moving one Bitcoin transaction is equivalent to 100,000 transactions on the Visa network. And I was like, okay, well, that might be some biased banking. I don't know. I didn't look in the data, but even if that data is correct, Bitcoin's moving $200,000 per transaction. My Visa is buying me a $5 cup of coffee. It's only twice as intensive to pollute, to move a dollar on the Bitcoin network versus the Visa network. And the Visa network's been there for hundreds of years, isn't getting better. The Bitcoin network is, uh, you know, is rapidly improving in terms of reducing pollution per, per transaction. And so, I, and I think there's a bunch of incentives like Waz. I was looking, the, the co-founder of Apple was looking at this way to make some sort of uh, way to focus on green energy for Bitcoin. And I don't know, I think, you know, I, I do think about this a lot. I don't have a good answer for you as someone who's green and loves Tesla. How do I get around the fact that Bitcoin seems like it's polluting a lot? Well, my take on that is if we're going to need a, an incredible store of value that replaces the current monetary system, we just have to dedicate a lot of energy to that. That's an extremely important asset for the simulation of humanity is the way we move money around. And so to me, we do need to dedicate a huge portion of our energy resources to that. And there's always going to be things that take more energy, AI, robots, you know, medicine. If you want to do an FDA trial, think about how much waste goes into that. But we're going for a little bit of progress to just cure 10 people. I mean, when you want to do crazy new things and humanity wants to expand, we're going to have to increase the, uh, you know, consumption of energy that humanity has, which is why I'm also so passionate about Tesla, because I don't think the amount of energy that humanity needs is staying stagnant. I think it's going to soar with things like Bitcoin and new technologies. And therefore, what's really important is that we have a really sustainable, cheap way to produce energy. That's why Tesla is so important. Um, and I think it's also super important to focus on ways where Bitcoin can minimize pollution. But so I do think that is one of the biggest things I struggle with, with being a Bitcoin shareholder or Bitcoin, uh, long Bitcoin and Tesla shareholder and climate activist. But that's kind of my take on it. And I think it's really the stagnation fallacy to say that Bitcoin pollutes so much. You know, look how much it'll pollute if it continues at this rate. It's it's ignoring the facts, which I'm just showing you that transactions are peaking, yet dollar moved on the network is spiking because dollar move per transaction is soaring and therefore pollution per transaction is, is decreasing. Anyway, that's enough of that rant. But um, what else can we show you here? So I think this to me is the chart that says everything. $120,000 moved, and we're looking at um, $50 billion moved per day on the network. So my take on Bitcoin right now, price in USD, um, okay, it looks like it's soaring. This is a linear scale. We're at 21000 here, hitting new all-time highs. But I think the slope of the Bitcoin graph, we can go to hypercharts here because I'll have a better uh, chart on this. Um, but so the chart, and we can look at the hash rate here on hypercharts as well. But so Bitcoin has a very interesting price history. And I think over time, its volatility will compress. But Bitcoin is an extremely volatile asset. And if you think about it, I remember I got into a big beef with one of my business school professors. He was like, look how volatile Bitcoin is. It'll never be a currency. And I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to go from a market cap of 1 billion to 100 trillion to, to debase the entire monetary system, we're going to need a lot of upwards volatility, right? And so I think if you de if you take out the upwards volatility, which you'd want if you were investing in an asset, I think that starts to make a lot of sense as well. And I think over time, the volatility of Bitcoin is decreasing and compressing. And if you compare it to, you know, a Venezuelan currency, an Argentinian currency, or somewhere that's not in the US or Europe or China, you know, a sort of third world currency, then you're going to see that Bitcoin's rapidly becoming almost as vol as stable as those currencies. And so, and it, it, it's over time, you know, it's stagnation fallacy. Everything with Bitcoin is improving and moving the right direction. Anyway, I wanted to show you this chart of Bitcoin. So you can see that Bitcoin here, we're hitting this new all-time high, but what does Bitcoin do? It does these parabolic moves to massive all-time highs and then overcorrects, but lower or higher lows. So look at this. We have, you know, 4,000 here 
Our Bitcoin starts at like 500, 400, runs to 20,000, and then crashes to 3,000. Now back up to 22,000. But I think what's going to happen here is I think we're just starting this parabolic move to a massive new high of like, I don't even know, before settling down and having building another base around here. This is just totally my guess. It's speculation. But it's this is just me extrapolating from the price of Bitcoin where we see these massive parabolic moves and then sort of corrections and recalibrations, massive parabolic move. And so I think if it were to follow the pattern, we're on the cusp of another massive parabolic move here. And what I think is driving it um, is you know institutionalization of Bitcoin. I just had uh, Michael Saylor on the program, amazing podcast. Thank you so much for the comments on that. We got like uh, 600 comments, something ridiculous, really fascinating. Of you know Square's moving its treasury assets into Bitcoin, MicroStrategy, uh, PayPal just launched Bitcoin, Coinbase is about to IPO, Cash App has Bitcoin for 33 million accounts. Um, is Apple gonna allow you to be to become a crypto wallet and store Bitcoin? Like. We're seeing the mainstreamization of Bitcoin happen rapidly, and this is a lot different than we saw in 2017. Like I think, although the price is the same place, A, the network is moving a lot more dollars, the brand value is way higher, we have way more accounts on the network. And this is another shout out I actually wanted to give. Like these, I'm using these charts, Hypercharts, BitInfo charts, CoinMarketCap. If you have any other websites with really good Bitcoin stats, please hit me up and leave them below because I would love to uh, throw those in there. But that is my take on, on what's happening with Bitcoin now, and I think the institutionalization uh, will only continue to accelerate. And at, it's, it's, it's this very weird self-fulfilling prophecy where um, as Bitcoin, more and more people hop into Bitcoin, it get, becomes more legitimate and the price goes up. And I don't know, it seems like to me, it feels like we're getting close to the point of no return where Bitcoin is the leader in market cap by far. A bunch of people have tried to copy it um, but nothing really gaining traction as much as the core Bitcoin algorithm. Now you have this decentralized network with millions and millions of accounts all around the world. Um, it's being integrated into like the stock market and financial assets and quickly and sort of slowly actually becoming integrated into financial theory, portfolio theory, where I think people will say, okay, you know, it just makes sense to have 1% of your net worth in crypto or, and if, if it's 1% of the $300 trillion of fiat assets and that's 3%. Uh, or $3 trillion of market cap, we're at $400 billion today, that's an 8x move. But I don't think that. My bull case for Bitcoin is digital gold 2.0. So what, it's not, it's not that it's gold but better. It's that it's a better store of value and inflation hedge in the monetary systems. And gold was the best inflation hedge and store of value in the monetary system for hundreds of years, even before money, really. Um, but now, you know, Bitcoin is a better gold. And so there's seven or eight trillion dollars worth of gold in the world. You can always mine more. A lot of, but a lot of that seven or eight trillion is held in jewelry or investment accounts. Um, basically as people wanting an asset that is a store of, of value and a hedge against inflation. So when I think about the TAM of Bitcoin, the TAM is all the people who want this hedge of value, store of value against inflation. And I actually think that product in the investing world where the US dollar is not backed by anything and we're printing a ton of currency, the M2 money supply is, is, is expanding at 20%, being that inflation hedge asset has never been more relevant. It's never been more cemented in the fact that this mathematically makes sense in terms of portfolio theory to have an inflation hedge in your portfolio. And I see Bitcoin as just being easier to move than gold. It's a $200,000 average transaction. And let's look at this, actually. I wanna show you something. So people are like, Hating on Bitcoin, um, average transaction fee. Let's look at this. It's been going up here, but what? Sorry, four bucks. Four bucks. So it costs you four bucks to move two hundred thousand dollars around the world in five minutes at the click of a button. I mean, that try sending a, a wire with a bank. It's going to cost you ten bucks. You're going to have to wait three business days. Try sending a, a ship of gold around the world. I mean, try trading with someone. I mean, this is and Bitcoin's only getting better. The stagnation fallacy assumes that it will not improve. Bitcoin's a technology project with the smartest developers in the world, constantly coding, shipping updates. You know, it's software. And so I think that Bitcoin um, actually it, part of Bitcoin's genius is that it's very hard to change. So I kind of misspoke there, but uh, it's like, you know, the beauty of the US political system, some people would say way back when was like the fact that we have so much gridlock means you really need a bold idea to really change things, which is actually good when you have something that's this big. And so Bitcoin has this very interesting psychological dynamic of uh, governance that I think is very interesting. But my point is, is Bitcoin keeps getting better. And I think we've seen the evidence here of average transaction volume going way up. And so when I look at this, I'm saying it is better than gold. Gold got 7 trillion. I think Bitcoin is easily 15 trillion because I think it's twice as good as gold. And I think that that gold's TAM is booming. And then I actually love this concept of 
everybody should be holding the majority of their wealth or half their wealth in Bitcoin because it's an appreciating asset with this natural deflationary tendency because of the 21 million. Like, why are we locked into a fiat money system that's constantly, uh, you know, I, my biggest pet peeve as an investor is dilution. I hate dilution, expanding the pie. So there's more shares. So my slice is worth less. That is my biggest pet peeve. Tesla was diluting, but they had to, to raise money because they're a startup. And even though they were raising money, they were super picky about it. They hate selling shares. They treat their stock like gold or like Bitcoin and they hated diluting it. Um, and I, you know, even like Arkimoto, it's another company I'm invested in where, you know, they've been diluting because they need to scale production, just cost a ton of money. But that's like the number one thing I'm focused on. If we're going to dilute, it needs to be for a really good reason. I hate getting my share diluted, but the M2 money supply, the dollars sitting in your bank account that you work so hard to earn are getting diluted at 10, 20%. And I don't see that changing. I just see uh, more economic crisis ahead, more stimulus, more money printing. I just see an increase in that cycle. And so I think it's the great awakening. I think people are saying, where do I want to store my wealth that I've worked really hard to earn? Is it going to get, you know, basically diluted as we print more money? Or do I want to get it in real estate, in stocks, in crypto assets where they can't print more? This is to me a very rational, uh, uh, you know, cyclical move of assets. And so I personally... You know, I don't really know if I necessarily believe the vision that like Bitcoin is going to do everything. It's going to take over the financial system. Like, I, you know, I didn't, Bitcoin is my second largest. Actually, it's my third largest position in my portfolio because I have Tesla and then SpaceX and then Bitcoin. So I've been holding Bitcoin for seven years. I was like at NYU blogging about Bitcoin when it was a joke, uh, writing for the NYU newspaper about it. Like, you know. Shout out to Lawrence Lenahan, my business school professor, who was like this VC. He was so awesome. And he brought in uh, Alexis Ohanian actually came to speak to our class and Charlie Shrem, this like two famous Bitcoin guy now, guys now. And Bitcoin was mooning at $30. It was literally in our lecture in 2013 or 2012. Bitcoin is hitting 30 bucks per share. And I'm like losing my shit. Everyone, the guy, the guy's like checking their price on the phone doing the presentation. I think it was Charlie Shrem. Like he got in a bunch of legal trouble or something. He's in a book with the Winklevi. Like, but now he was, uh, he's like, oh my God, Bitcoin hit 30. And we're all like partying in the room. And it's like, oh my God, like I, I couldn't sleep that night. I went home and I told all my roommates, we, we came up with this plan where we were going to invest in Bitcoin. And if it went up, we would buy Ducati's for the NYU Ducati share program. It was the dumbest idea ever. And we totally forgot about the idea, never bought Bitcoin. But then Bitcoin sourced to 500 a year later, I ended up start buying it, start blogging about it and got really into to it then. So I'm getting off track here, but my point is I'm super biased about Bitcoin. I always love, like I took my international finance class and I remember the day I walked in the door and we're like literally spending hours learning how to do exchange rates, how companies are, are developing a whole accounting department to hedge this currency, to hedge that currency. Um, and I'm like, bro, doesn't Bitcoin solve all this? Like, isn't it just first principles way more efficient to just have one currency we all use instead of like 800 currencies that we're constantly trading, transacting, hedging? It just is a mess. And so for me, the day I look, the day you walk into international finance, it's like, holy shit, Bitcoin would solve every single problem, save every company millions and millions of dollars. Te you know, every company has some guy, some accountant hedging with an Excel spreadsheet currency fluctuations. It's insane. And so um, I think... This idea of a, you know, Jack Dorsey has this idea who's like extremely bullish on Bitcoin. I think this is still the most underappreciated uh, catalyst for Bitcoin is you have most powerful, one of the most powerful tech CEOs in the world who runs Twitter and Square, the world's largest payments company, pretty much loving Bitcoin, wanting everyone to use it. I mean, that's a pretty big catalyst. Um, but he says it's the native di di digital internet currency or like the native currency the internet deserves. That just makes sense to me. It's programmable money. Like the dollar's not programmable. Like it's ridiculous to me that we have like paper that they then put online and like that's our you know so i think something that's programmable that is a network you know i love this this analogy that michael saylor had of like facebook's a social network bitcoin's a monetary network more and more people plug in square just plugged in with cash app bitcoin just plugged in uh with you know this wasn't happening in 2017 so the price of bitcoin is still at that 2017 peak but now we have 50 more million people exposed to it with way easier ways to buy and sell it i mean fundamentally to me that's an increase in intrinsic value And I still really think Bitcoin is, you know, risky and speculative. Like, I love risky speculative assets, but um, I've always just been fascinated by it since the day I heard of it. Just like clicked in my head of like, yeah, the internet exists. We don't have software based money. This is a no brainer. And if you look at like, literally we're like, have a rock that's gold. And like my roommate's like, oh yeah, like shout out to Leo actually. And he's always like, oh, okay, like 
I'm gonna buy invest in gold, right? And there's a lot of theories that people have. I'm gonna buy gold ETF if I wanna hedge against inflation. Okay, so we're using a gold ETF, hedge against inflation because shit hits the fan. You wanna have gold in a gold ETF where they have a bank and they're like, oh, if you do the right homework, you can get a gold ETF that actually owns gold in a bank vault somewhere. So what are you gonna do? The world falls apart. You're gonna get on a, a boat or a plane to London and show up at this bank vault with all this gold in it and be like, excuse me, can I get my tiny piece of gold? And then what are you gonna bring it back to your apartment and start chopping it up? Like, it's just, what? Like, it doesn't, you know what I mean? But if I have it on my crypto wallet and I can plug it in anywhere and like, you know, the world, it's still like some some I am legend, world falls apart shit, you're gonna want that Bitcoin. Everyone's gonna be using it. It's gonna be way easier. So when I think of the first principles of like moving this thing around, cutting it up, is it divisible? Is it decentralized? Can they not make more of it? It's just so much better than gold. And we still have Bitcoin priced at 400 billion and gold priced at 8 trillion. And so to me, this is the inevitable, this is just the first part of the Bitcoin thesis. Um, but to me, that is so, so clear. And that's that's the math that I do that gets me the valuation. And I say, if we're moving 50 billion a day, I had to get my Wolfram Alpha up because why not? Let's do some math together. Um, 50 billion. I'm like, is that even 50 billion? 100,000 million billion. Okay. That's thousand, hundred thousand million billion trillion. Okay, Bitcoin is moving right now at its pace, $18.2 trillion of value per year, okay? So so it's a monetary network worth $400 billion that's moving $18 trillion worth of capital per year. I mean, to me, there's like, oh, Bitcoin's going to be worth trillions. Everyone thinks that's ridiculous. And I'm like, I'm doing the fundamentals. And I'm like, okay, you know, what are the miners making tens and hundreds of millions on that? Uh, you can even do a PE ratio on the cash flow of that. But I see a network that's just in its infancy that barely anyone is understanding or getting access to that is already moving $18.25 trillion per day or per year. That's, that's uh, you know, PayPal, like I said here, moves 247 last quarter. Okay, it's, it's it, let, let's say it's times four. That's, you know, a bill, that's a trillion. And they, they're doubling, even though they're not. They're only growing at 38%. But let's say it doubles. Then they're at $2 trillion run rate. Like Bitcoin's already 20X, moving 20X the capital of PayPal, uh, or 30X actually. And I think it'll grow faster. And it's trading at basically the same market price. So if you're talking about price dollar moved, Bitcoin's one tenth the cost of PayPal. And PayPal's like this crappy piece of legacy code. Like they're probably still using the code that Elon Musk wrote in like 98 to run PayPal. I mean, have you used it? Like the UI, they, they updated the CSS, but like the underlying, it just feels like a crappy piece of software with a horrible UI and, and it's worth $300 billion. And, and you know, Bitcoin to me is, yeah. And so you know, uh, Coinbase is going to IPO. I think that's fascinating. I used to, if you go back and look at my tweets, I was like, if there's one asset I could buy in crypto that's not Bitcoin, it would be uh, Coinbase equity. Because I think equity and Coinbase are going to be the bank of the future. I think I put out a moonshot money saying Apple should buy Coinbase. I think that is a Apple. You should still buy Coinbase um, and integrate with like a, a digital hardware wallet and every single iPhone. I think that is Apple's next move to unlock a trillion dollars in value, become that services company, move into banking, is offer crypto storage and banking and assets. Everybody's going to want to keep Bitcoin. They're going to want to store it securely. Um, that will be the new savings infrastructure of the future if this is how it plays out how we think. And that to me is a trillion dollar wallet company. Is it going to be Coinbase? Is it going to be Cash App? Is it going to be PayPal? Is it going to be Apple? Is it going to be all of them? Um, I think that is really, really interesting. Coinbase IPO, yep, covering it now. So, um, you know, another company I'm invested in, shout out to Mike and Rainbow Wallet, uh, which is like this Ethereum. It's like a wallet for like weird things on the Ethereum network. Like you could, I hold my Unisox, a, a token to redeem limited edition socks. What if you want to trade your Fortnite skins? What if you want to buy any ERC20 token and hold it in a wallet? You can do it on Rainbow Wallet. So I'm bullish on crypto in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think uh, Bitcoin is, is the store of value digital gold. And then I think any asset that is digital, I'm kind of getting off track with Ethereum here, but any asset that is digital, like the mango problem, it's my favorite thing with smart contracts. Like, okay, we can have a smart contract that's programmable that says like, we need to move this asset here if this happens, da, da, da. But if it's a mango in the real world, let's say my phone's a mango, shout out to MKBHD for the new case. I got his new case, it's awesome. But if this is a mango and we do the smart contract and then like, Okay, and it's like, okay, you know, I have to send the, the the mango to like some guy halfway around the world. It's like, well, I still have the mango, so who cares what the smart contract says? But if it's a digital asset that we can embed in the smart contract and we can embed delivery of that asset and say, it's not a mango, it's a digital mango that you can have in Fortnite, then I can, then the smart contract will lock up that digital mango and deliver it. And so, I, you know, I see Bitcoin becoming the digital currency and then I see every asset that can be digitized 
uh, basically going on the blockchain or or if it has to have records or I, I, I don't know about that actually. That's kind of a bold prediction, but I think the mango problem is a very interesting way to frame the potential of which assets have the potential to be tokenized. And so, you know, it's not just Bitcoin that's going up. I'm going to I'm going to pull up Etherscan here and we're going to go into Ethereum because um, I don't know. Why not? We're scheming. So let's keep scheming. So Ethereum, I don't own any now. I used to own Ethereum. Uh, I wrote a ton about it in my book, $73 billion, the world's decentralized computer founded by Boy Genius, potentially alien Vitalin Buterik, really rallying back up here. Of course, it had this crazy move. Um, also kind of like Bitcoin rallying here though. But now what I want to show you is, is, you know, Ethereum is a money network. It's not designed to have a maximum. It's designed to keep printing them. And you don't just buy it to hold value like Bitcoin. Like it's like a battery. You know, some batteries are designed to do this. They last really long, but they're not the energy dense. Others are super energy dense, but don't last really long. So it's it, depending on how you engineer the network. Um, you know, every crypto asset is a incentive network. And so the incentive for Bitcoin is to store a value to hold it. The incentive for Ethereum is to, is, is to enhance the ability of decentralized computing by incentivizing that to have like this tradable value. And so when you buy Ethereum, to me, Ethereum almost has more intrinsic value than Bitcoin, you could argue, because you can actually spend it on computing. And so to me, I love uh, analyzing when I look at Ethereum, I'm like, okay, well, how are we going to analyze Ethereum just like Bitcoin? How many transactions are happening? How many dollars are moving? How many uh, gas is used? So Ethereum, uh, you know, you don't just transact on the network. You pay gas every time you do a transaction, but every transaction has a different amount of gas used. So if I'm doing running a super complicated smart contract with a shitload of code, it's going to take me more gas per transaction with to pay more fees to run that on the network because I'm paying for more computing. And so we're not just going to look at transactions, we're going to look at gas used. And so... Uh, this is etherscan.io. Shout out to Alex uh, Sankov for showing me this a while back. This is an awesome website. So this is Ethereum price going back up here. But what has gotten me bullish on Ethereum and the whole crypto space right now is we're not just seeing Bitcoin move. We're seeing Ethereum move. Transactions on the ETH network back over a million a day, 1.25 million, really hovering there. This is the beef with the Ethereum network that I had. It's like, bro. If we're going to cap out at a million transactions a day, like there's no way this shit's worth $70 billion. But now I think, you know, the stagnation fallacy over time, they'll improve. They're doing all these updates. Definitely been way slower than I expected. But you can see this is a very, very bullish chart for fundamental uh, transactions. But it's not just trading because trading would be a super low gas uh, utilization for that. If we actually look at the gas used, uh-oh, average gas price. Okay, that's the wrong one. Um... Did I miss it? I'm looking for the total gas use chart. Um, oh, daily gas use. Here we go. So that, okay, see, look, this is to all-time highs. So even though transactions peaked here, the actual computing on the network to me is at an all-time high because people are spending the most gas on it because we're doing more complex transactions. So when I want to value Ethereum, yo, DJ Medusa, not dude, thanks for the big super chat, bro. I'm, I'm just doing a dance because you have a DJ. But um, so... So I think that this is another evidence that not only are more transactions happening on the Ethereum network, but the complexity of those transactions increasing as well. That's fascinating. And so that's my thoughts on uh, on on that. And yeah, we got Bitcoin 23K. I mean, it's so volatile. Like it's it's really hard to know what'll happen from here, where it'll go. I mean, it's it's a crazy, it, you know, look at, look at the one month chart of Bitcoin or one year chart. I don't know. It's crazy. Like even in the past year, we, we hit, you know, this... 16,000 or whoops. I don't know. The price of Bitcoin, my point is extremely volatile. So I think people need to keep that in mind. Like it's an extremely volatile and experimental asset. And I do like, you know, on one hand, I do think Bitcoin is like, you know, viewed at as this speculative crazy thing until it's not. Like, like it's a speculative asset until it's not. You know, to me, to me, everything's a speculative asset. The US dollar is a speculative asset because you're speculating on the value of that thing which to me is paper that we print increasing 20% every year run by a government that's that's so bureaucratic that it can't make a smart decision. Like, and every single, and it's not backed by anything. Like to me, speculative asset is a misnomer. It doesn't mean anything, you know? Tesla's a speculation on Elon Musk and Tesla. You know, gold is a speculation on the, this shiny rock being more relevant and not having some really dope piece of software come out that's better in, in every single way than it, you know? So to me, every single asset is speculative. Every single asset is going to change in value. And to me, I want to be a contrarian. I want to think the US dollar is a speculative asset before anyone else does. That's how I'm ahead of the curve. I want to think Bitcoin is the best store of value in the world while everyone else thinks it's a speculative asset. And that's how I'm going to make, you know, that's why I'm up 30x on my Bitcoin, you know? And so it's, you know, Tesla, this is why I'd caution a lot of people being so dope, you know, pumped and thinking Tesla's so dope. It's like, 
well, Tesla's worth 650 billion now. How much are we pricing in? You know, every walk down the street, everybody thinks Tesla's winning it and taking over. You, if you know, uh, so the fact that Bitcoin has so much skepticism to me is actually, for my contrarian brain, bullish um, in a weird way. And and I think the amount that's been de-risked, like you don't have, you know, Cash App moving in, is to me that's like half a billion dollars of value. That's 33. It's, Cash App is going to have 100 million people funneling them into Bitcoin. They already have 33 million. That's 0.5% of the global population. I mean, this is, rap think about what happens when Starlink comes out and everybody that's in these countries around the world with shitty currencies can now tap into the Bitcoin network. Is Elon Satoshi? I don't know. Um. Okay. And see, dope piece of software that nobody has access to and nobody who has any idea who wrote it or, or has any idea what within it. That's a critique that one of you said. Not true at all. Bitcoin's open source code. You can literally read the white paper and literally go to the blockchain and see every single transaction that has occurred. It's, to me, the most transparent thing. You know what's not transparent is the US dollar and them ha the government being like, oh, we just printed more without asking anybody. Who cares? Sorry, you just got diluted. You know, we don't have any control. Like to me, like that's not transparent. So when you actually think about the transparency of it and the trajectory of that transparency, it's not, it's night and day. Bitcoin is the most transparent asset in the world because there's no human element. It's an algorithm. So um, Elon's not Satoshi. I know it's a joke, but come on, come on. We can have fun with it. Um, do you have any more questions here? I'm going on a rant. Um, I got, I got to bounce pretty soon, but we got Bitcoin soaring to 23,000, Ethereum soaring as well. The crypto resurgence is back. And I think there's huge validity to why this is bubbling up and becoming a thing in the financial system, because I see we need a better store of value. This thing called the internet exists, yo. I don't know if you've heard about it, but like, it's like this thing where like, it's this network and like, we all have like these computers that we can like log into it and like click a button. And then the software can go to anyone in the world. Like maybe that this whole world that is programmable and digital needs a store of value and a currency that's programmable and digital. Um, and, and I think that idea alone, if you think Bitcoin, you know, hits that Holy grail and has 30 X upside to be just the equivalent of gold, but double, then to me, it's a no brainer to take a flyer on it now because I'm like, okay, Bitcoin already has 50 million people using it. It's already like, it's, it seems like the chance of Bitcoin becoming gold 2.0 is 50%, yet they're pricing in a 3% chance of success. So, right? Because if it's 30X upside to 15 trill and, you know, you get 30X upside, I think there's a 50% chance Bitcoin becomes digital gold 2.0. Maybe that's the number you can debate, but that's, you know, I don't know. So, so as much as I'm not sure about it, to me, it's like gold's already priced in as being the $7 trillion store of value asset. It's had, it's had years to do that. Why is gold not going up? Why is it not accreting more and more value? Um, you know, because I think Bitcoin's soaking it up. And, I, and it's also like one of those fascinating things to be a student of the game. Watch the market. What is the market telling you? Inflows into Bitcoin are booming versus gold and versus other stuff. Maybe that's because people are, you know, like follow the money. You know what I mean? Or I don't know. Maybe that's a dumb idea. But I just think there's, there's something to be said for the economic evidence of Bitcoin's moving $18 trillion per year run rate. Like that is, that is not a toy that is not a joke, uh, you know, I, you know, I don't think that's speculative. I think that's, you know, and so anyway, this, there's a lot to think about here. And I also, you know, I love Bitcoin because this idea that we have this asset that goes up and we don't, you know, you're a doctor, you don't have to, to work on how to become an asset manager too. Like, you know, and you can actually build and store wealth. Like we work so hard. Like I'm, you know, you probably have a job. You probably working so hard. Like you're saving your money. Like, like you should keep that money and it should keep value and you should be able to spend it when you want. Shouldn't be getting constantly diluted by a government. I think that sucks. And I think it's, um, you know, at the detriment of, of a lot of people that their wealth, their wealth leeches away over time as the dollar's purchasing power erodes. And this has just been happening consistently. And I think that is, is kind of a sad thing. And I feel like so lucky that I hated the dollar. I put my money into Bitcoin and Tesla. And, you know, I, can't, I have like such a special place in my heart for Bitcoin because I Bitcoin on the 2017 run, I cashed out at 13. I sold the Bitcoin at 13, sold another half of Bitcoin at 17,000. And that gave me like 20 grand to literally have like eight months of rent and to live. So that I could, and this was in 2018, you know, right out. So the 2017 spike happens. I cash out of Bitcoin. Hyperchange has like 3,000, 5,000 subscribers. And I'm like, you know what? I think this has got enough legs to go all the way. I'm going to sell out of my Bitcoin while it's spiked. And just, you know, as much as I love Bitcoin, I love myself more. And I love Hyperchange more. And so I traded Bitcoin for Hyperchange equity or like invested in it. And 
yeah, that turned out to be the move. Like that was the six months I needed of runway to get hyperchanged off the ground, to get our revenue there, to start getting us profitable. And then I bought back Tesla stock. I bought back all my Bitcoin and more. Um, actually at a much lower price than how, how why I sold it. Just kind of coincidentally happened that way. Um, so I was able to rebuild my Bitcoin position. But I don't know. That's just kind of a random tangent. But I do have a really special place in my heart for Bitcoin because it was a way better store of my value than a fiat currency. And it led me to start my company. And I didn't, you know, I was able to bootstrap it all by myself because of that. And so... I, you know, that type of financial freedom, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of, of the retail investors and the little guy being ahead of these new technologies than Wall Street and capturing that wealth um, instead of it going to the bankers and financial system. And so uh, Bitcoin kind of has this weird Robin Hood uh, component to it. And, and it's just fascinating to me that it's out there. Everybody knows it and everyone with the access to the Internet can buy it. And it's just about like your limit to understand. It's like your brain is your limit. You know, you like, like, can you understand it? It's any 7 billion people out there, whoever gets it first is going to get the wealth. It's almost the epitome of like financial alpha natural selection. It's like, who's going to figure it out first? It's out there. That's where I think about anything, you know, the inform, you know, communication has not only been democratized by the internet, but information has. Look at this, what I've been showing you. I've shown you the stats of Bitcoin transactions, dollars move, transaction fee. Like this is cutting edge and we have access to so much data. And so, all right, I'm going to take up some questions now before I got to bounce, but this has been really fun. I, ho I hope you all enjoyed my Bitcoin rant. I'm not, I'm not going crazy. Uh, do you think government will actually go after cryptocurrencies and tax their value? I think the SEC has already established that Bitcoin, Bit, that's why another reason I'm huge bullish on Bitcoin. You want to talk about fundamental intrinsic value? SEC, Congress, PayPal, Coinbase, it has uh, legal bureaucratic inertia. It's already sucked into the system. And so... Uh, I think to me, that's one of Bitcoin's biggest strategic advantages is being a really sketchy crypto asset that everyone says is only used to buy drugs and then getting infiltrated to be, you know, legally recognized in the US. That was probably the biggest riskiest thing to happen. Now I feel like there's no turning back from there. It's been already too institutionalized. Ethereum 2.0. Great question. So I was showing you the Ethereum network. I think Ethereum, just like Bitcoin, has a rapid pace of innovation, keeps getting better, keeps improving. Um... What to buy? None of this is financial advice, by the way. I never give financial advice. I see a lot of you asking about that. Um, anyone else with a uh, question or comment? Um, have ever used Bitcoin to pay for food? I mean, I cashed out of my Bitcoin from my Coinbase account, moved it to my Bank of America account, and paid for rent for food for six months. So kind of, but not directly. Um, any other questions here? I know you guys have a lot of, you guys are throwing like all the like, Bad, how'd you mess in SpaceX? You're going to sell Tesla to buy Bitcoin. It's like, bro, come on. Like, give me a question I can answer here. Um, how much will the US, USD devalue? I don't know. So we have a very interesting thing happening where people are kind of in denial that the US dollar is devaluing because they just refuse to acknowledge inflation. Yet we are seeing every asset soar. And so I think that's fascinating. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Will Tesla, I, okay, okay, so I put out the video, of, I'm gonna, this is how I'm going to end it. Will Tesla add Bitcoin to its balance sheet? So I think every company in the future will search for a much better store of value um, if they're going to have, they want a store of value on their balance sheet. And I think right now everyone assumes it's cash and treasuries. Those have been sucking for 10 years or more and are going to continue sucking in the mind share of us going to what else can we have our, what's our fiduciary due to our shareholders? How do we maximize this cash in our balance sheet? Tesla right now has 15, 20 billion in the bank, not doing anything. They're at their board meeting and they're like, what are we going to do with this? We're not going to spend it for two years. We want to hold on to it. We're going to keep it in cash. It's going to get diluted at 15% a year. We can put it in treasuries. Those are going to suck. Like, like, is it like, like, you know, we just sold Tesla equity at 650, bro. Like, I don't want this to be devalued in fiat currency every year, unless we're going to spend it on factories right away. I think we need to be, every company is going through this WTF moment of, we know cash sucks. The problem is it's not kosher to move into Bitcoin or these crazy assets yet, but it slowly is becoming better and better. And so Square's doing it. MicroStrategy's doing it. I, I think it's a distraction for Tesla to do it now. Elon's got too much to focus on. Who gives a shit? Making $5 billion on our Bitcoin strategic investment because we should add it to our treasury early because hyperchange is annoying us. Yeah, who gives a shit? We're already worth $650 billion. Does not matter. So I actually think it's kind of a distraction realistically for Tesla to do it now because they have 20 billion in cash. If we want to move 1% of our cash, it's 200 million. You know, we're already kind of like too big. But the flip side of that, this is what I'm telling Tesla. It's like, 
okay, we can wait because it's a distraction. It's going to take a while. But deep down, I think this will become the norm. And it's going to be like, it's going to be kind of like, damn, like, are we really buying Bitcoin at 100,000 now as our treasury asset in five years or two years? And then I'm going to have, and I'm, and I'm going to have that gut feeling of like, dude, let's do it now. You know, okay. Even though we're only with 400 billion, like let's, let's be early, not late uh, on this. And so I actually think this is a conversation that's happening in every boardroom of every tech company. You think of a company like Apple, they're too big to move into it yet, but they probably know they should. I, you know, what are the conversations about Apple and Bitcoin? Like, what is Tim Cook on this? I'm so curious. Um, I don't know. I think it's right because I think Apple, you know, I think that's the next big shooter drop in Bitcoin. Cash App, Square, PayPal, who is next? All right. This is my Bitcoin rant. Um, I love you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. Um, please let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, anything about Bitcoin. And I'll see y'all next time. Have an epic, epic Thursday. Peace. Oh, shout out to our Patreon supporters, producers. Want to give them a shout out. You guys are awesome. Really appreciate everyone. We have the Patreon newsletter going out every week. Patreon.com slash hyperchange. You're making the channel happen. We have an... I have the... New HQ has been secured. I secured the bag on it. I've been opening all these boxes. This is not the new HQ. And I've been like moving in and it's going to be set up in a week or two. Like the production quality of HyperChange is about to go through the roof. And like, it's all because of my Patreons and you people watching. And like, I feel like HyperChange is not, it's not what it should be. Like we have not hit our vision. The quality's not there. This audio sucks. My fan's running. This camera's not good. My background's not dope. I don't, my graphics aren't cool enough. My, my intro beat's not dope enough. I know, and we're all getting it better. And like HyperChange, I want to give the ideas and the content, the quality, the production quality it deserves. And so we're going to do it. And I cannot wait. And so I'm just really like, really appreciative of like the support and all y'all watching because you really made that possible. And we're going to come out with the dopest financial media network in the world. And it's all funded by this grassroots community. And I'm just like, let's go. I just cannot thank you enough. I really appreciate it. Anyway, have an epic day. Um, peace out.